Good afternoon. Welcome to Corbell's Faculty Fridays. My name is Rachel Epstein. I'm on faculty at the Corbell School of International Studies. I'm also the Senior Associate Dean. And we're doing a very special session today to launch this year's Faculty Friday series at Corbell. And that is that we are turning the tables on our relatively new Dean, uh, Dean Fritz Mayer, uh, who it is now my pleasure to introduce. So in this series in the past, what's normally happened is that Fritz is interviewing one of our faculty members to explore with them in more depth their research. And I had the idea some time ago that it would be really fun to talk to Fritz about his research because in addition to being a brilliant dean, which he has been at Corbell for the last two years, he also has this incredible uh, research scholarly and also public policy background that um, I think animates a lot of his work at the Corbell School and is also a, a huge motivation for the faculty and staff working at Corbell. So I'm gonna interview him in the, in the coming hour. And to give you a little bit of background about Fritz, I'll just tell you briefly that his research over the course of his career, which has primarily been in public policy, came to us two years ago from the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University. His research focuses on three major areas. One has to do with globalization, that is economic globalization and its implications for workers in the environment. Secondly, he's worked on the politics of climate change at the global, national, and local levels. And third, and really the subject of the, of the conversation today is about narratives and politics, particularly, and we'll talk about what this means in a minute, uh, in, in resolving collective action problems. So I have a couple of Fritz's books here. Uh, one is Narrative Politics, this is the more recent one, and it's called Narrative Politics, Stories and Collective Action. And then Fritz also wrote an earlier book, which was on NAFTA, interpreting NAFTA, the science and art of uh, political analysis. And this book in particular uh, stemmed from one of his main policy positions uh, in the early 1990s, in 1992, 1993, uh, Fritz was the uh, International Affairs Fellow with Senator Bill Bradley, who was uh, one of the leading senators that managed the passage of the North Atlantic Free Trade Area. Fritz was instrumental in getting that passed. And then after his year as that International Affairs Fellow, he became Bradley's foreign policy advisor. So this uh, is a segue to uh, what I I think will be a great conversation about particularly narrative and politics in all of these areas of trade and economic integration and also climate change and climate policy. So Fritz, I'm gonna put the first question to you, which is why your focus on narrative um, in politics, why your fascination with stories, particularly I think after a career in public policy and particularly your deep engagement with trade policy and climate policy, why are stories important and of interest to you? Well, first, thank you, uh, Rachel, for that very kind introduction. It, it is uh, different to be on the other side of this uh, process, So, um, but I'm really pleased. Uh, thank you for having the idea of doing this. So why stories? Uh, it, it's a little surprising maybe because most of my work uh, would appear to have been on, on uh, trade issues, economic globalization, those sort of hardcore policy issues, but um, there's probably two answers to that question. One is I've always been interested in stories. In fact, I was a, as an undergraduate, I was a history and literature major, and I actually wrote my undergraduate thesis on the power of stories uh, in what was uh, called the Atlanta race riot of 1906, um, really more of a massacre, very similar to what happened in Tulsa and many other places around the country, but um, a white on black attack triggered by narratives, literally stories told about black people, largely to justify the injustices of Jim Crow era. Um, and it, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a devastating thing. More than hundred people killed in the black business district destroyed. So it was, you know, interesting for, for that reason because of the power of story to mobilize this mob, but also interesting because Atlanta wrote it out of its history. It literally never appears in, a, in, in, in history. I mean, there are people, certainly in the black community in Atlanta who remembered it. Um, 
So, we, so I've long been interested in that. But the other answer to that question is really related to the, you made reference to my role in, in the Congress. So I find myself in uh, early uh, 1993, in the beginning of the Clinton administration, in the, in the middle of this big fight over the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And, um, you know, at one level, a trade agreement's about economic interests and trade-offs and negotiation. I had done a lot of work in that area, but I was also dealing with the, you know, the public politics of this. And it became evident to me that, you know, for the most part, people made sense of NAFTA, not through careful analyses done by the Congressional Budget Office or anything of the kind, but really through the stories that were told about it. And I found myself actually going back to those sort of deep roots as an undergraduate um, to try to make sense of how people made sense of NAFTA, why they perceived it the way they did, and what, what was really animating um, the, you know, in my case, I was advocating for NAFTA, so I was trying to make sense of the opposition and uh, helping to devise a strategy to build public support or at least neutralize the opposition. And so I found myself back in this sort of narrative space, you know, what is the story that people were constructing about NAFTA? And frankly, as a strategist, what stories could we tell that would uh, help people be more supportive? So that was the genesis of this. And, uh, and uh, that took me in a very different direction uh, in terms of my own research. Good. Well, let me ask you something else more specific about the more recent book that you published on narrative and collective action. Why the subtitle stories and collective action? And maybe you could take this opportunity, particularly if you're negotiating a trade deal or trying to resolve political conflicts around climate change. What is collective action? What are collective action problems? Why is this figuring into the subtitle of your book? All right, so you know, in some sense, collective action is it's often said to be the, the fundamental puzzle of political and social life. What do we mean by the problem of collective action? They're actually plural problems, um, but it, it, it's the puzzle of why people vote, join, give, march, protest, and otherwise engage in political action. When it's costly to do so, time, money, risks often. And it doesn't actually matter whether you join, march, give, right? If you take voting, for example, I mean, it is the truth that your vote doesn't matter. I mean, there are no elections uh, in which one single vote, even the closest election you could imagine, and I, I guess there have been occasional ones, but even super close elections, your vote actually doesn't matter. In, in, in a narrow sense, then, if, if we were just narrowly rational, uh, we would not vote. We'd let other people vote or give to a, a cause that you care about or join. Or So in a very narrow sense, it's irrational to join, march, or otherwise act collectively. Um, and this is this is sometimes called a free rider problem. We free ride. There's an incentive to free ride on the actions of others. Of course, if everyone thinks this way, nothing happens. So the challenge is, how do you make acting itself, voting, joining, marching, behaving in whatever way, satisfying? Right? How do we incentivize? Because it can't be just because you care about the goal, because it doesn't matter whether you do those things. The goal will either happen or not without you. It has to be that you get something out of. And uh, in my mind, the, the, the key here is that, you know, of course, we're not wired that way, fortunately. You know, we're not just narrow, rational calculators of narrow self-interest. In fact, we care ab about doing the right thing. We care about um, our identity ultimately. And so the answer is that these actions, if you're marching in protest or you're voting, are acts of identity. They are expressions of who, who we are. Now, why stories? Well, to the extent that it is true that we have to get satisfaction from, from being a part of something bigger than ourselves, in 
in, you know, I basically argue that that is akin to or is driven by or enabled by a sense of ourselves in a story, that we are part of a historic movement, that we are part of it. And it's a story we can tell ourselves about ourselves. I am this kind of person. This is the way in which I behave um, and tell others as well. So identity is interesting because it's both a, about a story we tell ourselves, um, but also and importantly, stories that are told by others about us. So this is both a kind of uh, inward looking and outward looking. Uh, so it's, it's ultimately an argument that in the, in some sense, it's an evolutionary argument that the human capacity for narrative evolved to solve this problem of collective action. How do we cooperate? How do we not do the narrow selfish thing and do the thing that is in our minds, the right thing to do, the heroic thing to do, the appropriate thing to do in a story, in a collective story that we're a part of. And so it's no accident actually in my mind and, and in many scholars' minds that the rise of large scale civilizations in humanity uh, is uh, uh, occurs at exactly the moment where we see mythology and large scale narratives that enable people to uh, imagine themselves as a community and to align their behavior in ways that um, enable the community as a whole to accomplish certain goals. Okay, so I have to ask you a, a bit of a follow up on the first part of okay. what you said, which is Right, from a rational choice perspective, it's not actually rational to vote because any single vote in almost any election that takes place doesn't count. So why should people vote? Well, people should vote because if we didn't vote, we would have a disaster, right? right. So same thing about any collective goal, anything that we together agree should happen whether it's uh, saving that well, we might talk about climate change and we mm -hmm. care about the climate. Well, there's a huge incentive to free ride, you know, not to curb my carbon emissions, I'll let other people do that problem. So one answer to your question, we, 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 we have to solve these problems as, as you know, it's for humanity and in politics and in so many other realms. Um, so I, you know, I think that's the, that's the, the crux of it. And, and you know, uh, you know we we do it because we we answer the questions ourselves. I should do this. Use the word should. I should do it. It's a it's it's the way in which someone like myself behaves in a circumstance like this, which is very close to saying this is the way in which the my character would and should act in the story I find myself in. Good. Okay. So then if we get to a specific policy problem and one that we're confronting, I think really directly right now is climate change and its effects. Right. And you just mentioned that it's much easier for us as individuals to free ride on the efforts of other people, not to curb our emissions, not necessarily to even um, agitate for politicians or better public policies. So how, and I guess, Perhaps your experience in trying to negotiate NAFTA, get, get NAFTA passed might figure into this. What kind of narrative do you think would be effective for more productive activity in the direction of policies that address climate change more effectively? What should we be doing from a, from a narrative point of view, from a political point of view? Yeah, well, a lot of this is already happening. Um, um, but it is you know, just to start with the, the, the you know, to reiterate the, the problem here, which is uh, the most <laughs> difficult collective action problem I could even imagine. I mean, climate change is, you know, just in terms of its scale, it requires global cooperation. Uh, it's time horizons. It's, it's the least, I mean, it's just not salient. It's unlike anything it, it's so far in the future, one can barely discern it. I mean, obviously, some people have direct feedback, but, um, you know, one of the real features of story is that it enables us to imagine the danger that's over the horizon that we can't, we can't, you know, and, and look, look, I mean, our understanding of almost any political issue, climate change, trade, the Biden administration, you pick anything, 
is ultimately about, I mean, none of us have direct experience with these things. It's all about this, literally, the stories we read in the news or are fed to us in one way or another. So climate change is, is, is this colossal collective action problem. Um, and and you, you actually, in your question, you, you identify there's sort of two parts to that. One is, let's call it private action. Uh, do I you know, stop driving a gas guzzling Ford F-150 and trade it in for um, a Prius or if I have money at Tesla um, and take actions in my private life that are helpful? Um, uh, and the other is around political action. Same issue. Do I agitate, join, march, protest, et cetera, in, engage in political action with the goal of uh, changing policy? Um, at a national or international level. And it, it, it's just, I mean, the temptations to free ride are just colossal. I mean, it's just, and yet, we're, you know, we're not doing great <laughs> on this, but, but we are seeing, I mean, something of a global social movement out there of people who are, you know, often met young people who are, who are saying, this is wrong. This is, this is, this is a uh, an impending tragedy uh, that um, and it it it, it it's uh, I always argue that social movements at the heart of any social movement is a narrative and it's a narrative of injustice often you know it's a narrative in which uh, there's a impending tragedy of some kind caused uh, and the tragedy is a form of injustice or, 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 or in the case of climate change, you know, an impending disaster of some kind. Uh, and so the story is, the, the framing story here is, um, if you think about a story, then it's just a quick aside of stories. I mean, stories are, you know, uh, the classic story is, a, is there's a beginning, a middle and an end. Uh, uh, and they begin sort of once upon a time, things were either good or bad, and then something happens and then, things trend downward or trend upward. And there comes a moment of dramatic tension where the story could either end well or end poorly. And so in the construction of the narrative by people like say Bill McKibben, who's a prominent activist, he, they very actively tell the story of, as essentially an impending tragedy. Uh, tragedy caused by you know, human action by the choices we've made, often with villains like big business, you know, the oil industry, the exact, you know, it's, 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 it's a complete uh, 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 narrative with plot and characters and the like. And the story is basically told that uh, things were once good and pristine and we were one with nature and that we have as human beings, uh, uh, you know, polluted, added to carbon, et cetera. And we are at the, at the cusp of a, an impending tragedy. Now here's the key part about action. If all you do is tell an inevitably tragic story, that this thing is, you know, there's, you know, in the classic structures of narrative, you know, the fatal flaw uh, of Oedipus, it, you know, you, you know where that story is gonna end. It cannot end well, but in, in collective action in mobilizing people, there has to be hope. There has to be the possibility of a happy ending. And it, and what you're really trying to do is in, in, in you kind of enlist people, or, or uh, I use the word engross people. You bring people into this narrative construct. And if you listen to activists around the world who are working on it, they tell a you know a, an impending tragedy story. But the crucial thing is to is is to help people imagine themselves in that story and at that moment where if they act in one way, the story acts, it, it story ends well. And if they fail to act, it ends, ends badly. And so you see this in the, you know, in the social movements, in the political activism, in the rhetoric of those who are, who are trying to change things. Now, wow, this is a hard problem. I mean, it's just, you know, it's one thing to say that, it's another thing for that to be effective because a rate against that are all of the reasons why collective action is difficult. And that includes people, some of them big businesses who have an incentive to not act. And they tell another story. And so politics is often a contest of stories of one kind or another. Um, and so on the plus side, I think as a planet, we have begun to imagine 
the problem we face in terms that does mo you know that that mobilize, mobilizes action, but it's a hell of a problem. So let me follow up with one other, at least one other question about the climate issue because we've got yep. a colleague on faculty, Frank Laird, who has also looked at narratives around climate change and environmental destruction more generally. And in many interesting conversations over the years, he's pointed out to me that sometimes he believes at least that activists discourse around climate change is a bit self-defeating in the way you just portrayed in, in the following sense, that the impacts are potentially so catastrophic. Right. And at least some activists are saying irreparable, it's too late. Yeah. So, yeah. right, and there's a certain, right, there's a, I guess there's Absolutely. a tension maybe between scientific fact about how far down this path we've already gone and what we can actually do at this point to rectify it. Yeah. So where do you come down on truth telling, I guess, and uh, in some corners, is it is the is the discourse so negative that, that we actually, um, we prohibit people from engaging constructively at this point because it's too late. Absolutely. So just first of all, in narrative terms, um, you know, as I, I think that's the point I'm trying to make. I mean, if you tell a story in which we are doomed, there is, and there, you know, there's no possibility of a happy ending. There are no actions that could heroically say, you know, snack victory from the jaws of defeat that could, you know, save us from certain, you know, disaster. Um, if you if you tell that story, it is it is debilitating. It is, yeah. it is there's there and there's uh, in my mind that's a real problem in the environmental movement. If all you do is tell the sky is falling story and and you tell it too hard, then people sort of give up, you know. And they say, well, there's nothing we can do. Um, and and that really takes the energy out of the effort to mitigate climate change. It may enable certain actions to adapt to it, but it really does. Um, it does, it, you know, it is absolutely a problem. So you need to tell a story of, of you know, it's with hope in it, right? You, if, 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 if you don't have hope or you don't have, um, uh, the, as I say, the possibility of, of, of taking actions which could save the planet that could turn this around, then you, you actually uh, undermine collective action. Now, you asked a question about, you know, truth and 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 fact so stories all stories are fictions you know some are more true than others right all stories are are are, are you know have the form of fiction right there um but uh some are um better connected to reality than others and of course it's this huge challenge to take you know the complexity of climate science and what we know and the and and the and the you know the the various policy options that we might have and their possible effects and all the uncertainty around all of that and translate that into a simple storyline that at once motivates action and is more or less true. Uh, you know, my read of the facts are that we are not yet doomed, <laughs> that, we, that there is still time to act. Uh, certain things are now inevitable over the next century. Um, but one, if we don't act, there'll be a lot worse. And two, there is, there is still time uh, to uh, mitigate the likely consequences. Um, but it is a crisis. It is, there, I mean, this is the moment, this next decade, in my mind, I mean, this, this is, and, and this is, it, 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 it is always so important. It, it, this is a, you know, one of maybe the greatest challenge for humanity <laughs> to, to somehow summon the will uh, and uh, to act in time. Uh, uh, lest we suffer, you know, it's not just about the environment. What we know is that the the uh, climate change exacerbates inequality. It leads to food insecurity. It leads to all kinds of security issues. It leads to migration, all of which are fundamentally destabilizing. And the historical record is replete with other moments 
where societies have collapsed because of ecological consequences. And so this is this is a truly existential threat to humanity. So yes, I'm alarmist at one level, but you you can't go too far and you cannot just say we're doomed because that will actually make acting more difficult. Good. Yeah, I think so that raises a whole bunch of other questions, um, including about the, you know, the current Biden administration, but also the Trump administration and the role of narratives and story in elections and politics. And, you know, we don't necessarily need to stay on the issue of climate during the Trump administration. We certainly could. Um, what was the story, macro speaking, um, what was the what was the story that Trump was telling Americans and how was he so successful in what I perceive to have been a, a quite negative dark story uh, during his presidency, certain during, certainly during his inaugural speech. How do you interpret that period in terms of narrative politics? MAGA. Make America great again. It's a restoration narrative. It's a very simple plot line. Once upon a time in an imaginary America, uh, things were great. Uh, we were strong, proud, respected around the world. We had law and order, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, dark, the bad guys defined as Democrats, liberals, socialists, others, foreigners, uh, have brought America down. Uh, and they're the villains, really the villains in this story, the, those others, those, and, and we could get into the whole polarization and, uh, phenomenon, but, but which began before Trump, but Trump exaggerated, but it, he cast half of America in a sense as, as villains, real Americans and Democrats sometimes say, um, and and so the plot line is is a classic. I mean, it's like a classic American Western, right? You know, the the, the uh, I'm the and my, you know I alone can save this. That was what he said. So make America great again. Once upon a time, things were great in America, and all these villains have brought us down, weakened us. Uh, 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 and 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 so, I that is Trump can't alone can bring us back. It's a heroic narrative, and it it it's about um, restoration uh, to an imaginary past of that were when things were good. Well, this is an enormous. First of all, that form of a story is the is the most appealing story i mean we love restoration narratives we love the you know near death and resurrection story it's just our favorite story victory snatched from the jaws of defeat it's a um it's a form of a western it's a form of so many stories so it's an inherently appealing story but it also appeals powerfully to uh segments of the american public who uh, felt it and feel alienated from, you know, elites uh, who um, feel that loss of power and prestige, there's a racial dimension to this and it's, it, we cannot ignore. Um, and it, 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 it is sort of inherently appealing and it's enormously powerful. I mean, the, the, the Trump movement, Trumpism is a, basically about a story world about an imaginary world in which that has those features. Uh, so if you take Jill, if you take January 6th, you know, you take the insurrection, like what the heck were those people doing? You know, this is collective action, right? They, they collectively acted to storm the capital of the United States. Listen to what they said. They're, they're, they're the patriots. They are restoring, you know, they are restored and they imagine themselves almost as if they were part of the American Revolution. In fact, they, they actually use the language of that. And this goes back to the Tea Party, right? The, the Tea Party as sort of heroic patriots against despotism, et cetera. They, they imagine themselves as the real heroes in a story restoring America from these terrible people 
Um, there was a kind of a cast of, of various villains in that telling. It, it, you know, that's how they interpreted what they're doing. They didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They thought they were doing something heroic um, and still do. I mean, and, and just to get a sense of the power of story, right, the, the enormous fiction, and it's just, it's, it's a lie that Trump won the election. And yet I you know, saw a poll the other day that 70 plus percent of Republicans believe that story. Wow. I mean, they are, they are caught in a imaginary world, fed that information through social media, through a, you know, partisan press, word of mouth, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it, the grip of that story of uh, now, so the first one is this larger arc of America's story. And now, now I'm focusing on the sort of story of the election as having been stolen from Trump and him as the victim of these elites and the Democrat, et cetera, et cetera, is so powerful that it overrides all evidence. I mean, there's no evidence out there to support this. And yet you have, you know, three quarters of Republicans believing this, incredible. Mm -hmm. Or at least um, saying they believe it, whether they believe it is Probably another matter, right? We just well, we were just speaking with somebody else about um, effective polarization, whether that polling result might be a consequence of that rather than what people actually believe. But I'm going to leave that aside for now because I have another question that I think speaks to what you were just talking about, and it's around historical memory, how we construct yes. stories that motivate people to, let's say, constructive collective action, but that is also truthful about the past. So one of the Make America Great Again uh, strengths, I suppose you could say in terms of a narrative arc, I mean, it ignores so much of the racial injustice that is the past with which we all live and it shoves it to the sides in order to create, as you just said, a kind of mythologized, mythologized version of, of what America used to be. Yep. So how do you as a politician, or how does one as a politician, reconcile the need to create motivating stories that don't shove the past under the carpet, that uh, yep. openly confront the past? And, and in this regard, I will mention for those of you in the Corbell community, Fritz, along with others, has chosen a very interesting book. I'll, I'll show it here. It's called From Here to Equality, and it's by two economists from Duke. And it is about reparations for African-Americans, descendants of slaves in the United States. There are many critics in the United States, particularly on the Trump side, I think, of the political aisle, who would say this kind of incessant criticism and revisiting of negative aspects of the American past weaken the country and undermine identity and cohesion. Uh, I disagree with that, but that's how, the, that's how that yep. narrative goes. How do you answer those critiques and how do you reconcile fact with the necessity, I think, in politics of developing a motivating narrative? Well, that's a, an easy that, question. That's a big question. <laughs> so let me, let me, I mean, take it in pieces if I can. So, you know, every society has a mythologized history. And we do, if you ask uh, a group of, um, I mean, I've done this experiment, you ask a group of uh, students to, uh, Give, give me the outline uh, of a history textbook of America uh, with a little annotation and you put them in groups and they work on this and they will all come back with more or less the same story. It's, it's quite amazing. It's, a, it's a, a very heroic story of America, which tends to downplay, uh, you know, the frankly genocide of native peoples. Um, uh, acknowledges slavery, but basically says we fixed that with the Civil War, and then we tidied it up with the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you know, it's a very positive story that's comforting about America, American exceptionalism, what a great place we are, et cetera, et cetera. And those kinds of stories are, you know, some, one level important for a society to have, to have a, a, you know, a sense of itself in, in, a, in somewhat positive light, light uh, every society does that. 
So you see in the controversy, say, for example, the 1619 project at the New York Times, uh, led by Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, an attempt to really, as, as, as uh, Sandy Darity and, and, and Houston Mullen do in their book on reparation, but it's a really a clear-eyed look at our past. You know, that's, you know, slavery started in 1619. It wasn't, you know, it was central to, to America from the beginning, from the United States to the beginning. It's um, uh, these sort of clear-eyed looks at the past. Well, they're, they're hard to reconcile with that simple story, that simple plot line that is so comfortable that I got when I was going through school, still today, most most, you know, except in certain places, but most children get that sort of mythologized version of history. Um, so it's uncomfortable. It's it's very uncomfortable. Now, is there an available story that more accurately, at least, or more completely recognizes that? And I think the answer is yes. And 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 what is that story? Well, it's a it's it's a story that doesn't begin with kind of the the framers got it right and and we should restore you know the beginnings it's a story it's it's what uh, uh, i know call the long march to freedom story it is to recognize the complex painful terrible history of the united states and to imagine ourselves again imagination matters as as on a long march towards greater justice, um, uh, towards um, uh, you know the America uh, that uh, never was it and yet must be, uh, um, the the making good on the ideals that we were you know so so that story leaves space for acknowledging that you know truly terrible things have happened in our society um, and still do, that we're flawed. But, you know, that we are, again, coming back to hope, that we are, that there is a possibility for redemption, for improvement, for coming closer at least to the ideals of America. That storyline has been available also in our history. It's a storyline that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. used, right? Uh, somewhere I heard, he says, you know, all, you know, and he and he quotes the founding documents of the, you know, all men gendered at that time, you know, men are created equal, you know, et cetera. Et cetera. He uses the mythologized history to call people to make good on the promissory note, as he as he as he says in the "I Have a Dream" speech, and uh, so. There is that available storyline. Um, uh, uh, unfortunately, I mean, the, the other is very potent and you see, you know, quite a backlash against the 1619 project and other efforts. A uh, similar thing, I mean, we could, we could talk at length about historical memory that, you know, I, I've been struck by um, the whole controversy over Confederate memorials. Um, you know, what happened yeah, well, was was a mythologized history of the Civil War, particularly in the South, but not exclusively so, in which the it was called the Lost Cause. It was a you know a story of kind of a a rather benign version of the motivations of the Confederates and this sort of lost great age of you know of 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 the of the antebellum South, and Robert E. Lee is cast as this wonderful hero, you know, so. If, he wasn't really for slavery. He was a really, you know, thoughtful, decent man. He was just serving his community. Well, that's, that's just not true. <laughs> I mean, it's not true. Robert E. Lee was a terrible slave owner. He was, I mean, he was, he was, he was none of those things, but it, a story was created really around Jim Crow that glorified the Confederacy in certain ways. And it's very potent. And so now you see, as we come to grips with the fact that we wasn't such a great guy and the Confederates were, well, traitors um, and the toppling of these statues, it's very, very controversial um, and, and very heated. Um, no more could be said. I mean, they, historical memory is always about the present. I mean, it, it's, it's always, 
in some sense, a contestation. The stakes are about the present, ultimately. We use the, uh, the imagined past to help justify the actions we take in the present in one way or another. So we have a, a number of questions from the audience, which I'm gonna to get to in a minute, but I just have to ask you one other thing because you're mentioning of the Confederacy and the, you know, the finally the recognition that some of the people that we've honored in our public spaces should be remembered in specific ways, but not honored in the way that we've tended to elevate them. Yeah. So there are two, two, two questions that come out of that. One is, to what extent do politicians, and since you've been in the political world and connected to it for a very long time, I'm interested to know how explicitly do politicians think about the narrative arc? <laughs> and do they, um, do they hire consultants to help them construct compelling stories? I'll bet they do, uh, but I want to hear more about that and how. And then I guess stemming from that, it seems a bit problematic. Tell me if I'm wrong, but you know, as members of the public, do we have to be leery of being manipulated by people engaging in explicit strategizing about how do I deploy the best story to get people to, to do what I want to do? Yes and yes. I mean, uh, politicians feel this in their bones. And if they didn't, they got spin doctors standing by. And, you know, nothing I've ever written is a surprise to the practitioners. Of this. Right. I mean, it's, you know, uh, yeah, that's, of course, that's right. Yes, that's what we do. We try to tell a story. We try to tell it in 30 seconds. We, I mean, that's what, you know, th that's what this, it's, it's, they, they are totally on this, uh, framing things through simple narratives in which, you know, the other guy's a villain and my guy or woman is a, is the hero. Um, very simple, often negative ads, uh, typically, but, but very, uh, and, in, and they're smart about this. They, th th you know, they know how to spin. They know how to frame things in ways that, um, that work. I mean, this stuff works. Um, and, uh, I mean, we could we could take almost any example in it, you know, like, I mean, even the current context, you know, the, the narratives about Biden not being up to it, not being, you know, sharp, you know, it, it works, right? I mean, he's old, true. Uh, he, you know, because of his speech patterns, he sometimes can be inarticulate, right? So it's easy to spin the story that he's, you know, past it, he's not really there, he's not really, anyway, the point is, these in the political world, especially today, um, but always, I mean, we had Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. We've always had these kind of narratives. Uh, in, in, it isn't in and of itself new. Uh, what perhaps is, is new is the whole uh, narrative industrial complex of, 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 uh, of consultants and who test storylines with focus groups and the like. So, that's yes to the first question. Yes to the second question. Uh, you know, we 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 are swimming in a sea of narratives. I mean, we're we are being manipulated every day, whether it's to buy a you know a, a certain car or uh, to vote for a candidate or to believe one thing or another. And and uh, you know, I, I would say one of the reasons we should understand the power of narrative is to defend ourselves, to recognize. How because it's not just them, and I've been critical right you know, in, the, in this conversation of the Trumpism and Trump. I mean, we're all live in imaginary worlds. That's how we make sense of the world. That's what we're we are storytelling animals. This is how we make sense of things. We are all because we're in some sense our minds are constructed by narratives. Our sense of identity constructed by narrative. We are vulnerable to stories. The stories told to us by others. And it behooves us to be aware of the ways in which all of us are susceptible to spin to narrative and the like. Stories are, they're powerful things and they can be really important for good to build a social movement, but they're very dangerous things. Uh, and you know, my, you know, my, my personal family history that, you know, my, my, my name for my grandfather was killed at, in, at Auschwitz, so very aware of the history of Nazism, that was a that was a mythology. I mean, that was a narrative. It's very 
it can be very potent. And so we have, I, I, I believe deeply that we, we need to um, be aware uh, and guarded uh, 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 in our own quick judgments that we all make because we've been told a story that we want to believe. So now I am gonna to turn to some questions from our audience. Thank oh. you very much for sending them in. The first one I'm gonna ask is from Bill McDonald. Um, partly I'm asking it because it resonates with me personally very much. He's asking whether you can think of popular culture narratives, films, for example, theater, other sorts of art forms that you think really move the needle on public opinion on important issues. And he's asking because he understands, although I think he wasn't alive at the time this came out, Back in the 80s, I think the film, the TV film, The Day After came out, mm -hmm. which was about nuclear holocaust and uh, scared the bejesus out of me as a child. I would <laughs> say, I mean, I don't I don't know, Bill, if that changed public opinion more broadly, but that is actually one of the things that as a young person got me very interested in international politics, because I would say the nuclear standoff at that time was sure. kind of the equivalent of climate change today and really got me interested in, in that standoff, in that relationship between the West and the Soviet Union, particularly the US and Soviet Union. Reagan era was a very uh, obviously hostile era in terms of the discourse. So Fritz, I think the question for you from Bill is, do you know of pieces of art or fictionalized sure. versions of reality that um, have really changed public opinion in constructive ways? So, uh... Uh, an example that immediately comes to mind is is uh, Silent Spring, the Carson McCullough's book. And you say, well, that's not fiction. Read the book. It's actually a, an elegy. It's 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 a it's a very carefully constructed story. Um, and is it you know I, I always hesitate to use fact or fiction. I mean, I it it, um, it, it is a true story in a way of, although, you know, probably overstated, et cetera. It was about, for those of you who don't know, it was, it was the book that launched the environmental movement in many ways. Um, uh, now, many other things did as well, but it, it came along at a moment where it resonated with public imagination, the idea that DDT and other pesticides were destroying, you know, killing the birds, killing everything, and silent spring. Um, and it, it, it became kind of a, uh, you know, a very powerful, uh, document or ways to help people imagine the problem, uh, you know, that, that we've, we face. So that's one example. I think, you, you know, the one you, you cited, uh, you know, the, um, um, or, um, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, movie about the meltdown of, uh, of, um, you know, nuclear reaction, uh, a reactor and sort of the fear of nuclear power, you know, that, that, uh, triggered imagination. So, you know, I think um, I think you know, you ask about constructive um, engagement. I think they're both constructive and destructive examples uh, in which we imagine. And one of my favorite hobby wishes is the I was called the NCIS phenomenon, the plethora of popular culture uh, TV shows in which there's a terrorist at every uh, at every turn. Uh, in which we're under, you know, under, you know, great danger, and we, and, and it encourages an imagination of the world in which there are far greater dangers, frankly, than there really are. Um, so these things can be fiction, or you know, or fact. You go long back in American history to the, you know, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was, which was you know, now we associate Uncle Tom in, in, in another way, but at, at his time, it was the first book that actually captured popular imagination and enabled people to see many people who had previously not seen slaves as humans in, in a human light. And so it was quite influential in the, in the anti-slavery movement. So there, you know, there, there, uh, you know, all the president's men uh, that spawned a generation of investigative journalists in uh, Watergate, where you know, you know, Redford and Bernstein are, you know, uh, or I'm conflating the, the, the actors, but uh, Woodward and Bernstein um, uh, are are made heroes in a particular way. I, I do think um, art. Uh, 
uh, movies, whether in the form of, of, of visual arts, um, but also especially in, in narrative, whether in movie form or or book form or other forms, are 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 um, pretty powerful. And and they again they they're sometimes constructive, but not always. Good. I have a very related question from Magdalena and Donu. Forgive me if I just mispronounce your name, but she's asking, you know, given that we know, listening to you, but also from experience, that stories can inspire constructive action, but also destructive behavior. Uh, her question is, how? what can we do to increase the use of and the power of stories for good rather than for bad purposes, um, given that, you know, we... Unfortunately, we're subject to manipulation in all the ways that you've oh. described. What's the, and I guess this gets to the issue also of polarization in the United States. How do we get from where we are now to moving people back on the same page, especially if we're talking about something like climate change and solutions to it? She's also asking about, listen to the scientists. How do we do that through narrative? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I mean, that's a, you know, that, so let me, um, so one answer to that is 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 you know tell stories, good stories. And so I'll take the example coming back to climate change. So we did some focus group work when I was in North Carolina, uh, testing various messages um, and their you know their effectiveness and with with the focus group on climate change. And one of the least effective was a was language coming out of the National Academy of Sciences. Which was very scientific, and and it was uh, we um, very prominent, uh, you know, head of the National Academy of Scientists, you know, film of him stating these facts, and no impact at all. <laughs> One of my friends uh, who was involved with that report, who was uh, more of a, a PR guy, who sort of thinks in story terms, described his frustration of trying to get these scientists to tell a doggone story. They wouldn't put it in story form. Well, okay, but you're not going to have much impact. So, um, and I do think, and here I probably show my you know partisan leanings. I probably already have um, pretty clearly, but there, you know, those of us in the you know who do policy analysis and who do a lot of you know, we like facts and we like careful stuff and we nuance our findings and, and the like. And that is all to the good in most realms. But if you're fighting against MAGA, it's not gonna it's not gonna resonate. So I always say you can't beat a bad story without a good story. You need you've got to reframe this. You've got to do it. So one is just accepting that like it or not not all politics politics is complicated but much of politics is about a contest of narratives and so if you're not able to frame your side of the debate in a story term you're not going to be um as effective so i do think there's a kind of asymmetry uh out there there's a kind of simpler plot line and storytelling partly because it's pretty untethered to reality you know the more tethered it is this goes back to your earlier question the more tethered you are to reality the harder it is to tell a good story sometimes because it's complicated we don't like complicated stories we like simple stories and so finding and there's not a there's a i mean i i remember in the context we, we talked earlier and i had a role in the passage of nafta and I was trying to, I was sort of at the heart of orchestrating the effort to get this thing through the Congress. And, you know, you face a dilemma, which is, you know, do I talk to a group and try to communicate uh, what we know about plant location decision and why firms decide or don't decide to move their operations to Mexico and the ways in which only you know, a few industries really have, this, I, mean, I could go on at some length about it, I would just bore everyone, including our audience, on that thing. Or do you or do you find another simple story that you can that you can tell? And um and I'm not entirely proud sometimes of the storylines that we use. We basically said we needed NAFTA because it was a way of of uh competing with Japan. And then if we didn't have NAFTA, Japan would do an agreement. And I mean it was Japan was sort of in, Japan, by the way, was the China of the day. Yeah. We, we thought 
Well, you know, there's some truth to that. It was about competitiveness, but it was also, you know, not my proudest moment as a policy analyst. So there's there, uh, this is a really interesting question because there's an there's a, there's an ethics to trying to tell a story that is as truthful as you can make it, and yet is also effective. And there's a temptation, always, to for the for the ends to justify the means uh, because you think something is good to accomplish, but you can't, you don't have time to really explain it and bring people along really, and they won't really listen to you to tell a simple, cheap story that brings them on board. Um, and and uh, again, I think, I mean, how do you deal with that? I think one, you know, as, a, as, as an actor in politics, the best you can do is the best you can do to try to be as truthful as possible, to try to, to recognize the ethical challenges. Um, but it is not fully reconcilable. Thank you. So we've got um, another interesting question, which is another challenge, I think, maybe specific to our time from Doug Scribner, who's asking how the social media and all of its implications might have changed how you think about storytelling and narrative. It's a, it's a great question. Thanks, Doug. Um, Yes, yeah, so you know we've always told stories. I mean, in Salem they told stories about witches. Uh, so you know, social media is sort of the Salem witch phenomenon on steroids in a way. It's a gossipy kind of narrative. You know, I think the what has happened both between social media and the kind of fracturing of our more conventional media into cable news and a plethora of other outlets is that we've created. Uh, mini echo chambers uh, that have always existed to some extent in society, but on scales we've never seen before. Uh, and so, you know, so that's one aspect of answering that question is that stories are propagated through these media that might not have been propagated quite as fast or as effectively uh, as before. The other question, the other piece of this is around the you know social media is a little sound bites you know and it turns out we can tell stories in a very short form um and so there's probably a higher premium on the very short story or i'll put it another way we can invoke stories quickly so we have a we have a kind of a set of tropes or set of stories that are available to us in any given community and we can sort of invoke them in one sense or another. I, um, example, when I was in, in the Congress, we were working on a uh, question of whether we should intervene in Bosnia. And there were two available stories, Munich and Vietnam, appeasement story or quagmire. And seriously, the debate was Munich, Vietnam, Munich. Don't have to tell the whole story. We knew the stories. We just invoked the, the stories. So I think there's a lot of that kind of invocation of the stories that we already have in mind in these in the in the meet in the social media space where obviously you can't tell the whole you can't you know have a long narrative arc but uh you know we're pretty good at telling stories in in very um uh, very very short form um um so i think it's 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 accelerated or exacerbated problems that have plagued humanity forever in terms of our uh the susceptibility to to narratives but it's also put a particular premium on a certain kind of short form story and it's simple i mean it's 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 again it's 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 reinforced that tendency towards a very simple narrative as opposed to the complicated narrative and the truth is complicated thank you fritz so we have reached the end of our hour together. It has been such a pleasure to talk to you about this area of your research, Fritz, and your public policy engagement. And I really want to thank our audience for tuning in and for the very um, brilliant questions that you submitted. I'm sorry I didn't get to quite all of them. But stay tuned. We're going to have more faculty interviewed by Fritz coming up in Corbell's series on Faculty Fridays coming up. So please Stay tuned for more notifications about that. And just in the meantime, Fritz, thank you so much for everything uh, that you've also done for the Corbell School as Dean. Um, you've been Dean with us for two years. It's been wonderful. <laughs>
Well, thank you for that. And thanks so much for the opportunity to, to go on about my, my uh, passion about narrative. It's really interesting and very thought provoking. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.